Okay, so hi everybody um, and welcome to the PRISM virtual seminar. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, um, Sam Adhikari, who is an assistant professor of biostatistics in the Department of Population Health at NYU School of Medicine. Sam joined NYU after completing her PhD in statistics at Carnegie Mellon and a postdoc uh, at Harvard Medical School. Her research interests lie in developing and implementing statistical and machine learning tools to solve problems motivated by real world applications in medicine, global health and education. So with that, Sam, um, take it away. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. And it's really great to see in chat and learn where everyone's from. So I'm really excited to share some of my uh, research and I'm going to share my slides now. So can you all see my slides? Great. All right. Um, and yes, as Ravi said, please feel free to interrupt at any time and ask questions. I'm trying to, or I've tried to make my talk uh, a very general talk and there isn't a lot of specific details, but if at any point you're interested in getting into more detail or you'd like to, you know, get pointers, I'm happy to do that as well. Um, today I'm going to discuss uh, about my work that has been continued for several years now um, on social network analysis and it has been um, with my, several of my collaborators that I've had over you know over 10 years now so it's very I'm very excited to present this talk and present these ideas that we have um, been discussing over the years. Uh, and I'd like to thank my collaborators and my mentors um, with whom I've had the opportunity to work on this topic on conditionally independent network models for social network. And I'll go into more details on what I mean by that, but uh, let me first thank Brian Junker, Tracy Sweet, and Bo Dabbs, who were my collaborator from Carnegie Mellon and now at several other places and also my um, application collaborator, uh, Jim Spillan and Matthew Sherrill, who uh, very kindly helped us with real world application uh, to apply some of the methods we developed uh, in social networks. So for this talk, I am planning on first spending some time just talking about the motivation, giving a general idea of what a social network data looks like and some uh, motivating examples for our work. Um, and then I'll just review some of the existing work um, that, dry, that lie in the room of statistical social network models. Um, and then I'll introduce this integrative model that we have um, presented. So it's not a new model that we developed, but it's more like the model, the class of models that and ideas that we have developed using all these existing models that I will discuss in more detail and why we think it's a great idea to have this integrated additive approach for analyzing social network data. Um, and then I'll end with future extension, all the open questions and discussion. All right, so moving on, what is a social network? I'm sure it's not really a new topic for many of the people here. We always talk about you know, social network, we talk about relationship, we talk about connections, and Facebook is a perfect example. So we're making connection with other human beings all around the world. Um, so, and then it doesn't even have to be just human being, it could be um, interactions between protein, then we'll have a protein network. Uh, it could be interaction between different regions of the brain, then we'll have brain network. So a network is a way to define interactions between different units. Um, in my talk here and most of my work, we assume that we already have a network data, so a relationship is already well defined. But there is another line of work, which is also very exciting and important on defining what exactly, how to get a network data. Like from brain imaging, how do you get brain network? That's already an important question of its own, but I would not get into that in this talk. And in fact, in this talk, a lot of my motivating examples 
are from networks of teachers. So when they're asked, um, you know, network of teachers and specifically advice seeking network. So what I mean by that is if a teacher in a school goes to another teacher in the same school and ask question, then there is a relationship between those teachers that is based on advice seeking. And that would be an advice seeking network. Um, and I'll go into more detail of this specific network later in the talk. Um, so just to formalize the idea of network data, first visually, and then I will go into it mathematically. Uh, so in a network, we have nodes. Can you see my cursor when I move it? Okay, great. Uh, so the nodes or the actors um, and or the units, and then within, and then an edge or a tie that defines relationship between two nodes in that network. Um, it could be the relationship can be directed or undirected. So when we're thinking about Facebook friendship network, it's undirected. So both people have to accept to be friends. Um, whereas in advice seeking network, a teacher goes to another teacher for advice, right? There is a directionality to it. So the ties are undirected. So by this arrow here, we're showing the direction of the tie or the relationship. For example, this teacher goes to this teacher here for advice, but this teacher that I'm pointing to does not go back. So there is no reciprocity of that tie. Uh, and that's another idea I'll also go into in detail about you know, how we will describe some of these features that we see in the squad by just dots and arrows. So formally, a social network is a social structure made up of a set of social actors or nodes and a set of dyadic ties between these actors. So by dyadic ties, I mean you know, the relationship that I was showing by these arrows uh, in the plot earlier. Uh, and mathematically, a network is just a graph. So it's a graph defined by vertices, which are the social actors or nodes. Uh, and then the ties or edges between those vert vertices, it could be directed or undirected. Um, and other attributes that are, um, that defines the actors and the relationship in the network itself. This YIJ, so I'm going to use this notation quite a lot in this talk. Uh, I'm using it to denote the relationship from actor I to actor J. And it's um, an element of this big network or a matrix Y. Uh, for most of this talk, I'm going to assume that it's yes, no relationship. So YIJ equals one if there is a tie from I to J and zero otherwise. Uh, but it doesn't have to be that, you know, there sometimes we count number of times there is uh, contact from one node to another. So it becomes a count data. Uh, at other times, we're looking at a weighted matrix or a weighted relationship, and the weights define how strong the connections are. Um, but in my example, um, for a lot of the work that I will discuss, YIZ is assumed to be binary, uh, but the extension to other type of network data is usually straightforward. So, here I describe what a network data looks like and what it means. Uh, but as I alluded to you earlier about um, there are certain concepts in the network and summary, and summary statistics are used to define those concepts. Because uh, within a network, you might be interested in knowing whether a tie, how often a tie from one actor to another actor is reciprocated. So it's a reciprocity. You know, if someone is your friend, are you also their friend type of relationship? And we would want um, descriptive or statistics to describe that tendency in the network. Um, we might also be interested in how much connected the overall, how overall connected the network itself is. And that is another way to describe, you know, mean connectedness in the network, which is defined by density. So these are like global graph attributes. But the other question could be about who are these people in the network? 
and how often they're receiving or sending ties or how often they are connected to everyone else. So then we'll be looking at nodal attributes or nodal summary statistics. Um, and degree is one of the most commonly used. So degree will just mean, you know, how, what is the number of ties that node has? And if it's undirected, then in degree and out degree means the same thing. But if it's a directed tie, then that means how often are you receiving connections? And if it's out degree, how often are you sending connections? So in the advice seeking tie, it's a directed network. And um, we've seen that, you know, for example, if someone is central in the network, like a leader of a school, a lot of people go to them for advice. So that means that in degree of the leader is going to be really high, but out degree of everyone else might not be super high. So just to put that idea concretely and show you in examples, I have a plot of advice seeking network data here. Um, this network data comes from our collaborator Zim Spohan and his team at Northwestern University. Uh, this is a plot over five years, so the data was collected at different time point, and it comes from a survey. Um, so teachers were asked to nominate who or how often they go to other teachers for advice, and they nominate the teachers. Uh, from there, so what we can do is we can plot a graph or a network diagram that looks like this. Different colors are different schools. So these are schools within one school district, but there are about, uh, 14 schools. Um, and then each dot is a teacher. And then, you know, there are connections mostly between schools. So you can see this clustering structure, but there are also connections sometimes between school. So this is one way to visually uh, represent a network. Uh, and then this is just an interesting network because we have a lot of data that, you know, evolves over time and it gives us a lot of opportunity to also think about methods um, to analyze this network. So just some more summary for the network of teachers. There are 14 schools every year, about 300 teachers were surveyed. Uh, and if you look at the overall tie density, it's about 0.017. It's not high. So the that way we compute tie density is, you know, in a graph with n nodes, there's n times n minus one possible connections you can make. Uh, but over all the possible connections, how many connections there are. So that ratio is the tie density. So, you know, it's a pretty sparse tie where within school, it's more dense, but between school, the ties are sparse. Um, so I earlier alluded to out degree, and we can also look at that graphically. So for each teacher, I can compute how often they were sending um, ties. So how often a teacher in a school is going to seeking advice. And so most teachers are seeking advice from about five or six teachers on average, but then there are some teachers who are seeking, you know, advice from 15 teachers, but that's pretty rare. So the out degree, you're talking to five or less people on average. But then the interesting part about this network, the other interesting thing is um, there are some teachers who receive a lot of connection. So there is this asymmetry in this relationship where every teacher is seeking advice from about five or six teachers, but then within each school, there are these central actors or leaders or coaches who get asked for advice a lot. And when we look at the in-degree distribution, we start seeing that from this plot here. So just describing network graphically and summarizing the network statistics, which I just did, is one way to start analyzing social network. Uh, but a lot of time, the questions we get, or you know, my collaborators have, uh, is about not just the network summary, but we also want to understand what type of teachers are more likely to talk to each other, who's getting a lot of advice, 
Um, are they, these teachers teaching in the same school? Are these teachers uh, teaching in the same grade and that's why they're talking? Uh, do they have similar years of experience or are the teachers who's getting a lot of advice have higher years of experience than the ones who always going out for advice? Um, so for that, we need contextual or covariates. And a lot of time, we, if we're working with uh, survey data, we have those data as well. In addition to that, in a network uh, analysis, the other question comes for influence. So if two teachers are connected, are, do they influence the behavior of the other teachers too? I'm not going to go into detail of the influence model, but uh, I do want to just allude to that and say that's important part of network analysis. Okay, so now that I've discussed the motivation, let me go into you know big picture research goals. So why do we want to analyze social network and why do we need statistical model for social network analysis? Um, often the big goal for us is to understand complex network structures um, and association of structures with different nodal outcomes. So what I mean by that is, you know, once we get social network, um, we might want to understand, are there any communities within network? So that there are clusters formed and the interest is in detecting those community. We would also might be interested in predicting the link. Given the network can, and their features of nodes, can we predict what whether two teachers are going to seek advice from each other in the future time uh, and also and then most of the questions that i work with are understanding the relationship between observed attributes covariates and type formation what are the covariates that are associated with higher likelihood of type formation um, the other set of questions that we can ask in network is network influence um, and we've also worked on extending some of the existing models for that. So here the question is, you know, if teacher A is at seeking advice from teacher B, are they also influencing the characteristics of, um, is, is teacher A also getting influenced by the characteristic of teacher B? So if teacher B is high performance, is teacher A high performance because they were seeking advice? Um, and then there is this whole question about homophily and contagion that I'm not going to go into detail now, but if someone is interested, we can come back to that. But so I, the goal of this slide is to point to you that there are all these interesting questions that we can ask um, using social network. And why do we need statistical social network models or why are the existing models not sufficient? So one of the main complications with uh, social network is that you know, we can't really assume IID, independent and identical distribution, as we usually do in a lot of statistical analysis or in many analysis. So we cannot directly apply logistic regression or linear regression to um, understand the association of covariates with network. Uh, in a network data, it's very likely that it's not independent and identical. You know, if there is a connection between teacher, if teacher A is going to seek advice from teacher B, it's likely that B is also seeking advice from A. So this idea of reciprocity introduces correlation with ties. And then there's also the idea of transitivity where if teacher A is going to seek advice from B and B is seeking advice from C, there is very higher likelihood that A will also have a connection seeking advice to, from C. So the idea of transitivity. And then there might be, you know, if there is a leader and that leader is the key central figure in the network, where a lot of teachers are gonna come seek advice from them. And so it's higher likelihood that they, he will be sought for advice than other teachers in the school. So there is this order of dependencies in network that uh, model that assumes IID distribution of edges will not account for. 
and then in the example that I was showing, we had a temporal network. So network now is dynamic. Relationships are evolving over time. And it might be evolving in response to the fact that, you know, the teachers themselves are changing, you know, they're getting older, have higher experience, or there is an external intervention. So we'll need model to account for that. Um, and then also in this example, and in many social network examples, there is a hierarchical nesting structure. We observe networks within each school, but the school itself is nested within a bigger school district. Or we observe network for students in different classrooms, but then they are nested within a school. So how do we account for those hierarchical structures? And we'll need models for that. So extensions of existing model to account for you know, different complex structures in social networks are thus needed. Okay, so I'm now moving toward from introduction and motivation towards more modeling strategy. If there's any question, again, feel free to stop me. Otherwise, I will continue. Okay, so uh, in the realm of social selection models or statistical social network models. So the first type of questions that I was discussing about earlier in a, you know, building generative models for network, understanding community detection or understanding what type of features produces a network is known as social selection model. Um, and the other kind where we look at the influence of network on outcome is an influence model. So within the social selection model, there are two bigger classes of network models that are being used currently. Um, and one lies in the family of exponential random graph model or ERGMS, and there is a rich literature for ERGMS itself. The other group is latent variable network models. Um, my talk is mostly focusing on latent variable network model, but I just want to give a very brief one minute introduction to ergoms for those of you who might not know about it. So the idea in ergoms is instead of um, to account for correlation of ties in a network, the correlation is adjusted as a covariate explicitly in the model. Uh, and what I mean by that is here, if I look at this equation, the probability of ties in a network is some function of network statistics. The psi A of Y is a statistics defined in a network. And I kind of talked about it earlier, mentioned what statistics could look like. It could be out degree, in degree, uh, reciprocity, tie density, you know, so if I, a very simple model will be, you know, probability of tie is just a model with intercept parameter. So if it's just an intercept parameter, then that model is accounting for overall tie density. But that's not enough. So what happens in these models is, you know, you make um, assumptions about what could be the factors that's related to uh, probability of forming tie, including, um, so exam simple example is an intercept only model, but then we can also have sender and receiver effect to account for a uh, differential effect of um, sender and receiver to receive and send ties. And then there can be a um, ergoms with um, a triad or a click. And so it can keep on going to be more complex. And that's an exact, uh, that's one way to model network model. Uh, so if, for anyone who's interested, I have some citation here, but I'm not gonna go into detail. What I would just point to is that the last part of an example of a type of ergon model where we're modeling the probability of y is equals one as a function of some reciprocity parameter and sender and receiver effect. So this is a class of P star model. Here we have you know, an effect that comes from whether a I was a sender, so in sender specific intercept, and then whether R was a receiver for the J. So what this does is it accounts for this differential effect of receiving and sending tie in a directed model. And I am 
I'll come back to this model because this is like one of the special organs, which is also part of the CID model that I'm going to discuss next. Um, but otherwise, there is a big difference or on the type of ergams and then type of latent variable network model. Okay. Um, so the model that I will discuss in more detail is the latent variable network models. And these models account for correlation implicitly rather than explicitly. So here um, the idea is, okay. So, oh, so sorry to interrupt. Um, uh, I'm just no wondering, there's a, there was one question in the chat that pertains to your last slide. So maybe uh -huh. if, it's, if it's convenient, I'll just ask that out loud now. Um, okay, please. So the, the question was, given the non-IID nature of the data, would it make more sense to revert to a probit model rather than logit, especially given that probits capture non-IID relationships? That's an excellent point. So I've seen both being used, both probit and logit, and I have seen them being used more for computational reasons than for non-IID reasons. So I'm not sure if just having a probit link will solve that. But having a probit link sometimes allows um, for the sampling, where instead of sampling from binomial, we can sample from the normal and have you know, different latent variable structures. So my familiarity, I, I'm not sure how often probit link is used uh, in the ergams class of model, especially when this network statistics itself starts getting more complex. Um, and it's not just defining a tie, but it's defining different structures of the network. But I have seen probit link being used in the next class of this model, latent variable model, and there the advantage is more for, from a computational perspective when we have a lot of assumptions on what type of latent variable there could be. Okay, so in the latent variable model, um, the assumption is, you know, if the, there is tie between two nodes, then there must be a latent variable that's explaining why they are having the connection. And on the flip side, if we knew what the latent factors for each of the nodes were, then we could define what the probability of having a tie is. And it's a very clever way of modeling things. So it's like any other latent variable, but what, the reason I like it is because one, it reduces the complexity of the model. So in the network, we have you know, n by n um, possible ties. So network, if we represent by a matrix, it's n by n matrix. And then when the problem is converted into the latent variable, so latent factor, then we assume each node has a latent factor. So it reduces the complexity from understanding this high dimensional network to understanding uh, some lower dimensional um, feature of each net node. So just to put that idea visually and more concretely, I'll give example of latent space distance model um, that our group has mostly worked on intensively. And it was first proposed by Hoff, Raftery, and Hancock in 2002. So that if we had an observed network, um, then what latent variable model is assuming is there exists a latent variable or latent factor Z that explains how likely a network is or how likely two nodes are connected in the network. So in the latent space model, the latent variable is a um, latent position of each node in some Euclidean space. Here it's a two dimensional Euclidean space. So each point is an actor or a node in the network. And based on where they are in, relate to, in relation to each other, that defines how likely two people are gonna be connected in the network. So in latent distance model, it's based on the distance. So if they're very far, it's likely that their probability of having a connection is very low. And it also offers a social interpretation. So it just means, you know, related to each other where you lie in some social space and are there people you're more connected close to than others and so on. Um, so mathematically in the latent space distance model here, we're assuming that the probability of forming a tie conditional on the latent 
uh, variable or the eating factor for node i and j is inversely related to the distance between those two nodes in the sleeping space. Uh, and as an example here, I plotted one of the networks for one time point, the advice seeking network. Um, so I fitted LSM, and then if I look at the leading position, you start seeing that social structure, right? The schools, teachers within each school are closer to each other within in the leading space compared to teachers between different schools. And the relative position is what actually matters in these models. Um, and the other extension that is common in the literature and that I often use is also like once we have this basic framework of a latent variable model, we can also add covariates. And most often our uh, um, question is about, you know, how the covariates are associated with the probability of warming time. Um, but we can still account for this latent variable uh, in the model itself. So the latent distances now have this dual interpretation. They're also latent variable, but they're also model residuals because they represent what is not already explained by these covariates in the model. Uh, and XIZ here is uh, our edge level observed covariates. Um, so when we have nodal information to include them in the model, we often have to convert them in the, the edge level covariates. Uh, and, you know, we can discuss that later, but that also needs a lot of hypothesis and the questions we're actually interested in to convert um, node level covariate into edge level covariate. Okay, so over the years, we have um, worked on extending LSM for different scenarios, um, sometimes adding covariates, sometimes um, extending them to model network over time. Um, and also because it's directed network um, in some of the existing work that it is under review, we have added sender and receiver effects, another latent variable within LSM, combine those and have a new latent variable model. And it's not just us who've done that. Um, in the literature, it's very common to combine one latent variable model with another and then extend that to actually model social network. Um, so here, in addition to the work we've done, we've also you know, added with um, computational tools. So we have our package to model hierarchical latent space model. Um, and this work was by Tracy Sweet and I worked with her to develop our package. Uh, we also have our package to, ex uh, to fit models that is an extension of latent space model to fit um, longitudinal network models. So, you know, network of teachers over time and how do you model that. So it's also an extension of LSM. And then it's not just us who have worked on extending latent variable model. Uh, it's, you know, everyone in the in the community who have worked on latent variable model, they will combine different models to come up with a new model that will fit their data bit better. So as an example of other latent variable models here, I just outlined a few. Uh, standard receiver model, which was also one of the er simple ergoms, that is also part of the latent variable model if we assume sender and receiver effects are latent variable. So it's an example of latent variable model. There's stochastic block model. So there the latent variable is, you know, instead of having n by n matrix, you assume that each node, they lie in within certain community or blocks, and the membership to that community or blocks becomes a latent variable. Um, so it's a very fast and commonly used tool to detect community for social network analysis. And there is an extension of stochastic block models to then account um, as mixed membership stochastic block model where a node can not just be in one block, they can be in multiple blocks and so on. So the story here is 
each of these models have some structure that's common. The framework is common, uh, but it has been worked independently by different groups to you know, either model the network uh, using some model or extent combination of models to model their network as we had done with our latent space, with our extension of latent space network model as well. Um, and that made us realize that there is a common framework within these different groups of um, network models. Uh, and each of the authors here, so co-authors in this paper, we were all working with different aspects of latent space model, but also latent variable model itself. And we wanted to combine them into one integrated framework. And that was when this paper, we started working on this paper on CID network model that just got published in social network um, together. And Andrew Thomas, Brian Junker, and Mauricio Sudimbe, who were other members of our hierarchical network model group at Carnegie Mellon, who also had a lot of input in helping us develop this idea. Um, Sam, I'm just going to quickly ask mm -hmm. a question that was raised in the chat um, from two slides ago, uh, I think, which says, has anyone, I think referring to the uh, latent um, variable models, has anyone extended this methodology and successfully scaled it up to massively sized networks? Oh, that's a really good question. And I have it as part of future extension and uh, challenges in my talk later. So that's, that's a, an excellent question. And I know that for some models, for example, uh, stochastic block model where you can use spectral based methods, it can be uh, scaled up to larger network, but in the framework that we're using and a lot of these models are being used, which is in a Bayesian framework, uh, computation is one of the biggest challenges. And there are some extension to use variational, uh, approaches to calculate from the posterior mean. Uh, but the current framework that I am explaining, we don't have that. So just to formalize the latent variable model, um, here, you know, in the LSM, we had this F as the distance between the node. But in any all of these models that I just discussed, the link what is important is to model probability of forming a tie conditional on latent variable on node i and node z as a function of these two latent variable. And in LSM, I think, is one of the most straightforward latent variable model because there the intuition is the function is the distance between those two positions. And the further you are, the probability of forming a tie becomes smaller. But you know, there could be any other functional form based on your assumption how uh, two nodes might be related to each other and have the ties forming. The other important aspect of this paper in particular is on, you know, formalizing how to combine different CID or latent variable models. So we call this latent variable model a CID model, which is conditionally independent ties model because conditional on the latent factors or latent variables, the ties now become uh, IID. And that has a lot of advantages, including in estimation and computational. Um, and that idea can also further be extended to combine different latent variable models. So here, you know, as I was showing earlier and talking about it, LSM has been combined with center and receiver model or covariates quite often. So these are combinations of latent variable models and assuming or conditional on them, the ties will be independent. So formalizing this idea, we can introduce or reintroduce an additive structure on and called it an additive latent variable model. So each of the latent variable component now can be an additive piece of this likelihood. And as a side, I have been talking about logistic, uh, logistic link function, but this G could be any link function type depending on the type of data. So few examples that of latent variable mod, uh, of the additive CID model that has commonly been used. One is, you know, additive of latent space model with covariates. 
So conditional on the covariates and latent space, the ties are assumed to be uh, IID. If, but then latent space model does not always account for the asymmetry in ties, especially if we're working in directive network. So then it has been extended to add, you know, sender specific and uh, receiver specific random effects in the model. So this accounts for this asymmetry in receiving and sending ties. So this is an extension of CID model again as an additive form. And then if we really wanted, we can literally combine any combination to form another model, which is still a CID or conditionally independent ties model. Um, so in this paper, we show how we can formalize this idea of additively adding different components of existing model to form another latent variable or CID model. And then we can also then take advantage of the conditional independence assumption, so conditional on the variable. Now the ties are independent, and then we can have likelihood-based estimation. Uh, and based on our prior assumption, we can use Gibbs sampling within Metropolis Hastings to actually sequentially sample uh, from each individual component of this model conditional on the remainder ones. So I'm not going into the details of the computation, but we do have an R package that already does this for you, but, and the details are also in the paper. So why consider this additive model? I think there is a lot of advantage. So even though the community was not intentionally thinking about it, it had been done before. And one advantage is that it accounts for you know, higher order of network dependencies, um, including reciprocity and transitivity, but then there could be clustering, there could be other, you know, having a leader who's being sought after. So all of that, once we, if we can identify latent variable or a combination of latent variable that can account for that, conditional on that, we could assume that um, one, that ties are independent, and then the latent variable itself could be informative in understanding some of those structures. So that is that comes as a part of the interpretation. Uh, you know, in SPM, it's a community detection, so we can know what the clusters are within the network. Uh, in the latent space, it's a social space, so relative to each other, you know, where they lie and what it means. So those are. Um, important aspect of this modeling framework. It helps to understand clusters and different types of important nodes in the network. The other advantage, which is a very big advantage, is just a tractable estimation framework. So without any structural assumption on the network, uh, the problem itself gets very difficult. And that's also one of the challenges in the ERGAMS framework, uh, as we have more complex assumption um, the model, the network framework, you know, model runs into the issues of degeneracy. And so having some structural assumption makes the estimation uh, tractable. Um, and then as part of our ongoing work, but also one of the important part is estimation with missing ties. So if we can assume what the network ties are missing at random or completely at random, then uh, we're only working with likelihood conditional on observables. So that helps us work around it. Uh, but we can also uh, impute missing ties because we have a generative model. Uh, so we can, you know, if there is a tie missing between two nodes, using the modeling framework and the um, generative model that we assume, we can impute the tie. And that's also advantage of this framework. Uh, another advantage is covariate effects. So if we use latent variable to account for all the structure uh, and then also have covariates in the model, um, we're more likely to estimate the association between co the correct um, association between covariate and uh, likelihood of forming a tie. And finally, we have an R package that already help, lets you do a lot of this computation. All right, so, but in terms of challenges, I think it's an exciting avenue to explore and there are a lot of opportunities within these framework, but at the same time, 
there are a lot of challenges as well. And the challenges lie within individual uh, latent variable models, but then if we combine them in this bigger additive models, they only grow bigger. So the main challenges, I think, is the unidentifiability. Uh, for example, in LSM, you know, the likelihood is related to the lead in space of position of the nodes through the distance, but then that position itself can change. Like if there is a, for different, uh, the distance is fixed for all these different isometric transformation, right? If the position was rotated or reflected or translated, the distance is still fixed and the likelihood does not change. So if we really want to understand what this position looks like without some constraint, we cannot estimate it. Um, and there are tools to do that, but it's one of the challenges when we're using these models to look at latent variables. Um, for individual models, a lot of these constraints are already being developed, but if we're putting together in the additive framework different components, then it's not just within the individual component, but between, and those need, um, it's an, it's an open question on thinking about how to make, what are the constraints that will make them identifiable. Computational time is also another challenge, especially with really large networks. So, you know, for smaller networks, like 300 networks, we could still have it in a reasonable time within a day or so if we're using MCMC, but as it goes, as the network grows, um, the order of computation increases as well and it becomes challenging. So another avenue is to find suitable met methods to make them in, um, scalable. Uh, and then the last piece where I think is very, it's an active area of research. A lot of people are thinking about it and we have also been thinking about it is on model selection and goodness of fit. There are a lot of things I put under the rug, including dimension of the latent variable, uh, or other degrees of freedom, um, and how to select those. When you're looking at community detection, what is the optimal number of community you want, or what is an optimal dimension of the latent space, um, hasn't really been thought out. There are some work that use uh, non-parametric Bayesian approaches, but those are not, um, it's not been used as much, or we still wanna know uh, for a lot of the existing models, we still need to find those parameters. So model selection is an important question. And then also assessing goodness of fit when we have so many um, open options to use for network analysis, which is the best fitting model uh, and how do we decide that is also an open question. We have used posterior predictive checks to make uh, assess goodness of fit for um, some of these models, but there isn't one answer. And then within this framework, you know, there are a lot of extension for each of these individual pieces again, but how do we combine them in an integrated framework as we did for the CID model for cross-sectional network um, is the next step that we're thinking about and is an open question that if anyone is interested can think about. All right, so in summary, um, I gave a very general overview about uh, social network models uh, that lies in the class of latent variable network model. Uh, and then I introduced this new generalized additive framework that we've developed, where, which we call the additive CID models. Uh, and the underlying assumption here is that ties are independent conditional on the latent variable, so if we, uh, assume that there exists in latent variable, then we can model complicated clustering and other correlation within ties in a network in an easier fashion. Uh, I also discussed utility and flexibility of this modeling framework, but there are a lot of open questions within this literature that needs to be addressed. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take any more questions too. Thanks so much. Um, so yeah, I guess let's just open it up uh, 
to questions now. And, um, you know, I'd just like to also say that I particularly encourage any students um, to feel free to, to ask questions as well. Okay, looks like we have a question in the chat which says, uh, can networks be affected by more than one latent variable? So, yes, if I think if I may rephrase the question, it probably means can we have more than one type of latent variable in the network? I think um, so. Yeah, so I think so. And that is the more main goal on why we were thinking about, you know, these additive uh, additive model because in this model, if we look at it, it's a combination of latent space model and then the sender and receiver effect. And both of these can be considered latent variable because one is modeling how the tendency of two nodes to, you know, reciprocate the ties based on how close or far they are in the Euclidean space. And then the other is just giving each node some number, right? It's giving this sender effect and receiver effect and that is telling it its tendency to send a tie or receive a tie. So based on that, um, the each for each of these ties, we can have how likely, based on the sending tendency and receiving tendency of the nodes, we can say define a likelihood. So in this model, what this is doing is accounting for two similar nodes to reciprocate ties based on their distance. And also for each of these individual ties to either based on the tendency of the nodes to send and receive the tie, how likely this uh, tie is going to be so that it's going into the light here. So yes. Thanks. Um, so there's another question in the chat which says, uh, can we utilize structural equation modeling in your paper? Um, I have not thought about it. I haven't thought about it in the context of structural equation modeling. Um, so actually, I don't know. I've seen those mostly in the context of causal <laughs> models, you know, and causal assumptions, um, but maybe. Okay, great. So there's, um, there's another question in the chat, uh, which is, can you talk a little bit about longitudinal measurement with networks using latent variables? I am working on a project that aims to improve information dissemination within a large organization. And as their efforts for dissemination improve, hopefully, I think the characteristics of the underlying variable will change too. Do you have any thoughts on how to think about this? Yes. So I, I don't think I have these on my... Can you still see my slides? Um, it's uh, now your slides are back. Okay, I was gonna see if I wanna see if I have any, I don't have any backup slides from for the longitudinal models, um, but this can be extended to account for longitudinal relationship as well. And that's something I am working on right now. Um, so the way we assume longitudinal dependency or correlation over time is to have these uh, latent variables to have some kind of longitudinal structure. So I work, I extended or I used um, random walk assumption that the mean of the latent variable centers around the prior position and then extended that to also have some structure on the covariate itself and that makes this model identified and also have account for the temporal correlation. So in that regard, some of these models can be extended for longitudinal network data. The other part of your question, I think, was about the network affecting the characteristics of the nodes, if I'm understanding it correctly. Is that it? That's, um, that's right. Uh, the, the... The person, the person who asked the question said, um, uh, I think um, as their efforts for dissemination improve, I think the characteristic of the underlying variable will change too. Do you have any thoughts about how to think about this? Right, so I, that's 
more um, difficult question. And then it also goes, I think collagen variable model will help in answering some of those questions, but um, a lot of time it's difficult to isolate whether, you know, two teachers, the characteristics are changing because two teachers are similar and part of the network or whether it's changing because of the network connection. And that's like homophily and contagion question. Um, so we've been thinking about it and I personally believe in their work done by Cosma, Sulezi and others um, showing how conditioning on latent variable might be able to disentangle some of this relationship. But we have not done it yet. Thanks. Um, so maybe in the interest of time, there's one more question in the chat and, uh, and I'll just ask that. This is from uh, Mark who says, have you had success with highly nested data? The random effect structure might be hard to identify separately from the network structure captured in the latent space. For example, they could be vying to explain the same covariance structure. Yes, that's an excellent question. Um, and we have been struggling with that as well. So a lot of time what we do and what um, people in the literature, what the literature has done is to add additional constraints. So we might have to constrain the variance of the latent position. So when we specify the prior, the prior variance is gonna be relatively small, which means in effect, we're you know, constraining some norm of the space itself, uh, the positions, and that makes it identifiable. So I think what Mark is referring to here is usually the intercept in the model, as well as the variance of the latent space the covary. So if one is increasing, the other really increases as well. So if likelihood remains the same, uh, but we might not be able to disentangle those two parameters separately without having additional constraints. And similarly, we need constraints also for sender and receiver effects. Great. Well, that brings us to um, noon Eastern time, uh, which is the end of the seminar. So thank you so much. Um, and thanks to everybody for joining and participating. I'm going to stop the recording now and uh, hope that everybody has a great day. Thanks so much, um, Sam. Thank you.